okay, uh, good to go. So apparently the the projector which was flickering last time was sent for repairs. So we're gonna we're gonna use this temporary projector today. Uh, and we can probably try to play a little with it just to make the larger. This will work. So that's probably the best we can do today. I cannot maybe slightly reduce the light. Reasonable. Well, let's hope that the next projector will, will be able to outshine the, the lights in this room. Yeah. So anyway, so we are ready to do our midterm, right, uh, on Thursday. Uh, just again, just a little bit of a uh, recap, meaning that, uh, uh, remember, it's an open notes, open everything exam. You just cannot uh, search on the internet, cannot communicate with your peers, and cannot... Uh, use tools like chat GPT and stuff like that, right? So, but you can use uh, anything what was uh, used in the lectures, kind of like uh, if you wanna access lectures online, that's totally fine. If you wanna use something like object dump, it's fine. You can compile something, also fine. Do whatever you want. Wanna use GDB, full go for it. Uh, and we're gonna do it on grade scope just to save paper and uh, in general, just to save our time on like uh, printing and scanning the exams. So, and if you really have issue with that, then let me know and I will figure out a paper copy for you. So, and today what we're gonna do is just, uh, we're gonna solve the midterm exam from last year. So, which is probably the best way to kind of learn uh, what is usually happening, right? So, and again, just uh, a little bit of a kind of like uh, background Around here. So this is a picture of my dog, which I love, obviously, right? So I took it uh, right on the morning a year ago, right before the midterm recap lecture, just to illustrate my point, right? So she's playing in the snow next to the Steiner school. We had a bunch of snow last year and we had some, had some snow this year as well. So if I ask you a question, which picture do you like better? Left, right? left right obviously left is a little better although as a photographer i'm not a probably not a success right so and why is that what you like the the one on the right well what's the problem with the one on the left let's put it this way right so it's overexposed right and so if we look at the histogram of uh, pixels right so on the overexposed uh, picture, right? Almost all the pixels are here, right? That's why everything else is bright here, right? That's essentially, that's white, right? So there's a white pixels in there. And like, we have something like something here, which is like probably this part, right? Which says, okay, look, uh, if I give you an easy exam, then the whole class is overexposed. Every, everyone gets A, right? Uh, and so that's why I want an exam, which gives me the full histogram, right? Uh, so essentially, I, I really want to see who is the best person in a class, right? It's not that, you know, like, in in numerical terms, same number of people will get A's, right? And just like say, like, okay, maybe A is all this, right? It's not like the, the first person is A, right? So, but I will know who, who got the point, the things which I was trying to explain, who got them better, right? So I, I will have, like, the top five people in a class, right? So again, don't don't worry about numerical grades. The way everything will be curved in this class, probably even I would I would say that more people will get A's than in 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 an, in an average class, right? So I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about it. But exams are slightly higher or slightly more challenging. Uh, and it, it, the reason I'm explaining this because I don't want you to be like offended or anything. Like you say, look, he gave us a hard exam. He wants us to show that you know we didn't like we don't, we don't know what we're doing. It's not the case, right? So I. I, I've seen a bunch of bright students in this class during my office hours and during my lectures, right? So 
uh, my point is that I, I want to like in this in this photo, I want to see everything, right? I want a proper histogram. Okay, so enough of this. Let's uh, switch back to solving the midterm. Any questions right now? Sorry. Kind of a little dark, right? I can't see your face. This? This? Oh, wow. It's very artistic. <laughs> it's all dark. This is, ah, this is the problem. Okay. Stick with this. Okay, any questions about the midterm on Thursday? Same time, same place, one and a half hours or how much time we have? One, one hour, 20 minutes, right? All good? Okay, so where do we even uh, get this midterm, right? So look, I, I actually put all the midterms online, right? So where is it? Let's say here. Then uh, what do I have here? Oh, my Zoom, crazy. Let me move it somewhere here for now so like uh here in our class uh, schedule right so on the day of a midterm there is this february 29th examples from previous years and i actually put all of them so like i'm pretty sure i have 2021 midterm you can take a look at what was happening in 2021 but that was still i think done in 2021 fall i'm I think I still was at UC Irvine. So this is the exam from UC Irvine, which has slightly different schedule. Uh, and it was actually a, a, like uh, just simply an undergraduate class. And this is the one from previous year, which was given here, right? Uh, on grade scope. And you can like essentially see what, what was happening. Okay, good. So let's start with this first question. So uh, overall, like I gave... Uh, I gave uh, seven questions, different degree of complexity. Some are simpler than others, right? Uh, what's the bait? Okay, we can, can, what I was trying to see how, what's the best way to to, 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 to annotate and solve it. Okay, maybe like this. Okay, so start with this one. So this one asks, uh, Write the C or pseudocode for the simple function that constructs the following pipeline that counts the number of uh, main strings uh, in all the files in the current directory. So, okay, who can tell me how do we approach it? Now we'll start. Maybe I will. Are you asking pipeline or that? Mm, what I'm asking is, uh, I'm 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 asking you to to write C code, which uses okay maybe that deserves clarification. I agree. So I I ask you to construct to write C code, or close to C code, right? That's why I'm saying pseudo code. So don't worry about correct with C, but just okay. more or less correct, uh, which essentially constructs. Uh, essentially uses fork and exact to construct ah. this thing. And let me, meanwhile, start another thing uh, in which I will be typing. Uh, so start with that and just start with the basic working thing. Okay, so what you're saying is that uh, we probably don't, do we need this? My picture. So you say, okay, let's, let's, do we all understand what needs to happen on this? So what we need to do is uh, essentially in the end, construct two programs, right? One uh, connected with a pipe and another one, right? This one executes uh, let me just zoom in here slightly. Uh, this one executes uh, grab main. Really? And this one execute WC, right? So how do we go about it? So we can uh, we can fork twice, right? Uh, agree with this? So we can do something like fork. Uh, and uh, get a PAD. And if if we are inside the child, 
if PID equals to zero, we're gonna do what inside the child? Correct, but uh, just uh, like any... we have a pipe. Correct, so we need to create a pipe, right? And we will, let's say we have this array of uh, P, which we declared somewhere, which will be a pipe, right? So we first pipe, and then here we, uh, if we say, look, we want to construct grep here, we need to, we need to redirect output. Mm -hmm. Right, so how do we do this? Close, what do we close? Yeah, standard output, right? Close one, and what do we do? Yeah, I, I forgot which one. No, yeah, yeah, I trust you. Duplicate one of the pipe, right? So, and this is where this open book nature of this exam comes handy because I mean, I don't like remember if you wake me up, which one is one, which one is zero. So you can quickly look up the pipe uh, signature and like, or man pipe to understand what it's, what is going on there, right? Okay, cool. And then we do one, uh, uh, then, yeah, don't forget to close everything, uh, close P1 and uh, close uh, P0. And then we do exact of uh, whatever grab. And again, you say, look, I don't really remember the syntax, uh, but go ahead, look up the source code of your homework, for example, which was submitted, right? So for the cell to understand how to invoke the graph or in the lectures, we also had examples of uh, how to invoke exact with argument, right? Mm -hmm. Good? Like what you were saying, with the open everything nature of this, that should be pretty straightforward since we already wrote this. Correct, right. And like, this is a very simple question. So, but again, unless you didn't study at all, that's probably a little mysterious, but if you know the general concept, so answering the question is not, not a big deal, right? And uh, again, you, you're gonna, roughly speaking, inside the parent, you can check for the error if you like, but uh, which would be better. You're gonna do fork again, and you're gonna get to the, uh, let me do a new page here, uh, journal page after, uh, you're gonna fork and you're gonna do again, if uh, PID equals to zero, you're gonna do the WC kind of closing and opening everything, everything. And then you can say, look, I, you know, maybe wait for my, wait for my children twice and then I will exit, right? Mm -hmm. So that's roughly what we, what we want in this solution. Question. Yeah, good question. So I think false answers will be correct. So because it doesn't tell you that you have to survive it. So you can you just maybe justify it with a with a, with an answer. But you did this and this because of that and that. Another question. So should we like to justify it? Like, we decide that we don't want to keep because we can be like we're gonna wait zero, which wait for new child. Like if we don't like to keep getting food or not, we can just do it like Right, so uh, like you do whatever you want. So I like I waited twice for balls. Like I, I didn't care about the order, and I think that's correct because if you're waiting for a specific, no, you, you anyway you will be waiting. You don't know the order in which they're gonna finish, right? So you have to wait for for a PAD. And maybe I misunderstood what you were asking. So what what's the? Uh, I'm just saying like so you can instead of doing like the other work, you can just wait. Ah, this way is so to just how to write the code. Uh, that's correct. So I would still write it this way, but uh, why is that? Because I would also argue that it makes sense to check for an error code in case fork fails, right? So it's kind of cleaner, more, yeah. You really like only react when PID is zero. And then in a parent, if it's negative, then say fork failed. Just bonus points. I don't think we will just subtract, like take away any points if you if you don't do it, but more or less. Okay. Any other questions?
Okay, this is the easiest one, so we have to keep going, actually. Okay, so simple, right? So everyone is on board, nothing super special happened here. Okay, a more advanced question takes, I don't know, like, I like square numbers, 19, not sure why it should be 20. Maybe I was adding like 555 five, five or something. Okay, this is a more interesting question. So do you guys even see it or am I in your way? Just move away slightly. And it's uh, it's a little smallish, right? So, and we have the zoom here, so we will move the zoom, zoom somewhere away here. So this one does the following. It says, okay, you have a C code for a string land function in the x with six kernel, right? And what it does, it takes a string as an input, this one, man, like it's really, let's just do maybe something better, 150, uh, 125. Uh, takes a string as an input uh, and just loops uh, until it reaches the zero like terminator of the string, right? And then returns the number of characters found, right? So pretty much standard standard implementation of a string land. And then I say, look, here is a dis disassembly of this function, right? And I ask you, uh, I ask you to explain or annotate every line in this disassembly, to essentially explain what the instructions are doing, right? Again, not a big surprise. So for this, maybe we don't even need the split window. So we will uh, actually, Ah, okay. Let me do this trick, which is a, which is a great trick. Uh, let me do the following. Let me actually open the the PDF in a Zorno. Where's my Zorno? And I will do file. Take PDF. Let's see. was from this, from here, right? So make room. So we just, this will allow us to keep this on, on a single screen, right? Uh, okay, so it's a little like, try to remember the source code, but let's let's start working on the, on the annotating the, the assembly instructions, right? So let's start by just simply looking at our wonderful, these two. So what do we do here? Write down the stack. Correct. So what you're saying is that it's just, just maintaining the stack frame. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I agree with how you phrase. So like my annotation will be short, but I, I would like to see something like uh, either line 200 sets, saves the old EPP, uh, line 201, uh, initializes the new stack frame along mm -hmm. those lines, right? Everyone that is on board with that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So what's the next one? This one. That uh, parameter from the uh, stack. Okay, so what what variable is that? Do you remember? Uh, S. S, exactly. So this one... Uh, this this one, this is the argument which was passed on the stack, and this is EBP plus eight gets S into ECX register, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, so what about this comparison? To check whether... Like, let's give a chance to someone else. Sorry, uh, check something. Sorry. Correct, so why, why are we doing this? So on line 206, I guess the instruction 206, that is uh, just checking to see if the current EPX uh, pointer is uh, pointing to the new terminator. Right. So essentially, we're checking here if the someone passed us an empty string. And if so, we're essentially immediately jumping to 220. 220 is here, right? We are setting EAX to zero, right? Uh, popping the frame and returning the length of the string. And remember that this function signature returns an integer. That's why a result is in, in the EIX, right? Agree with this? Okay, cool. 
So then uh, we got it. So it's kind of like a corner case in which uh, in which uh, someone passed us an empty string. Empty string. Okay, what about this one? Zor EDX EDX. Maybe Initialize EDX to zero. And we're guessing that this is the variable int n. By the way, see that we didn't allocate it on a stack. So compiler is smart enough. I mean, x 6 is compiled with, uh, I think, 01 or simply O. So there is some level of optimization. So the compiler doesn't goof enough, doesn't goof, like, it's not completely like uh, obnoxiously goofy, like we've seen in previous examples where we really allocate every variable on a stack, right? So it's, it's, it's just like a normal, normal compilation tool chain, right? So this variable n is allocated in the register. And so we're setting it to zero, right? Okay, this is a tricky one. So what is this? It's a good part. Is that literally just a no op? Good. No op. So why do we need this no op? Uh, uh, right. And so the answer for which uh, like which we received last year, which we took as a as a great answer. The person literally wrote, I'm not sure. It looks like alignment because maybe there is some benefit in jumping to an aligned instruction. But you're right, it's a no op of length three. And we can guess because we have a couple of those no ops which compiler injected in exactly the same, exactly the same instruction. Mm -hmm. And we've seen alignment at the end of this instruction. Why do I the why do they align here? I have no idea. So that's beyond my understanding, but it would be cool to like look up uh, again, anyone who does PL research and yes. probably there are people in this class, they can go into LLVM and this is GCC. So GCC might behave differently and see internals of GCC and see why is that they are aligning, aligning uh, instructions like that. But yeah, it's a no. And it's okay to say, I'm not sure, but you know, it looks like this and this, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So what about uh, this addition? That's easy, so it increments the one. it increments n by one, and it says, okay, let's compare. ECX contains the strings, or uh, contains the string. This is our n, so this is exactly. Look, it uses a byte specifier here, guys. Who is eating chips? Maybe stop eating chips. You know, like it just <laughs> we can hear it. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and you compare it with a now terminator, terminator, right? And say, look, if the comparison uh, is correct, we're actually moving current value of the EDX in the EAX. And if not equal, we jump to the next iteration of a loop, which is here, right? With a jump, not, jump not, not equal instruction. If not, however, we restore the frame and return and EAX already contain, sorry, EAX already contains the the return value. Good question. So, oh, the right. So you can use any. So these are real addresses in the in the disassembly, uh, and these are just line numbers, probably from a forgot from where I got them, but from somewhere, right? You can use any. On the two hundred nine or two seventeen, why are we using EX? Uh, good question. And uh, yeah, it will save you an instruction. I agree with that. So, roughly speaking, probably unnecessary, right? So the compiler chose this this way. And uh, as a human, you can say, look, I can optimize a little bit better. My loop will be tighter. Um, again, internals of the PL research and why we chose this compilation, I'm not sure. Uh, 215. Uh, pa, 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 what, are you, what are you saying? Yes. This one? No. 213. 213. Oh, this is 213. Ah, 213 in the, got it, got it, got it. Got it. Uh, this one. So why is it doing times one? One by one. 
It might be just how the disassembler, uh, maybe in this instruction, you always have to specify some multiplier there. I'm not to... right. So I, I don't exactly remember, maybe the specific uh, addressing mode takes a multiplier always, and it just shows the multiplier. Although, yeah, you can read it without one. So it, it will not do multiplication at this. I mean, it actually will probably in a pipeline, but uh, it will be, doesn't matter to you that much. Any other questions? Right, correct. So I believe what you're saying is that like this multiplier can be like one, two, four, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that there is some restricted range of those multipliers. Maybe I'm wrong. So we can we can go ahead and check for the CMP instruction. Uh, all right, exactly. And so the, the, the instruction set was optimized to go through the arrays of specific sizes. But, uh, and I, the, the real question is like, and you can look it up. Let me just maybe, okay, I wanted to change the color. How do I do this? Uh, maybe this is my color. So the real question with, ah, oh man, okay, sorry. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, the real question here is that like, what is the freedom? Can you specify any value there, like 55 or anything like that? And I think the answer is no, but I can be wrong. So you can look up the instruction set and say, look, let me just go easy here. No, yeah. So if this one can be like 55 or not, most probably not. I'm pretty sure that it can be one, two, four, eight, maybe something else, yeah. some powers. Okay, cool. So any other questions about this, this assembly? Why do we move it, right? Yeah, so like EAX should contain return value. One of your classmates said, okay, this instruction should probably moved somewhere here. Oops, sorry, pause the, pause the, yeah, uh, it can be moved safely. It looks like it can be moved past this jump, right? And you say, I will be jumping, jumping, jumping. And uh, I, don't, I don't really know why compiler says it's okay to, to have this instruction on every iteration of the loop instead of just the last one. And uh, it's, it's, it's a tricky business, right? So like if you really get into this business of cycle level accurate optimizations and uh, where does it matter? So maybe you're building some kind of a runtime for a programming language and you implement some cooperative scheduling like user level threads, right? And you say, look, my scheduler has to be so fast that I care about every cycle. And then you really have to like try both combinations of the code and see which one runs better. And the funny part, I've seen a paper, like a real academic paper about comparing different implementation of uh, uh, string copy instructions, right? So instructions with just copy memory or mem copy from one place to another. And it's surprising that different implementations win on different machines, even within the family of x86 and AMD, I mean, Intel and AMD CPUs. So this is pretty amazing that like there is not no single answer. So like, for example, your Lipsy will have a mem CPI. It might not be optimal because on this specific, again, machine, because you use it like it has specific instructions and extensions and specific combination of those wins. And sometimes you don't know upfront. So because the hardware changes a little unpredictably underneath. Okay. Anything else? All good? So this is, so we have like a question like this on the exam. Yeah. It would be okay to group up these like 200, line 200, line 201 saying this is a stack frame setup. Probably, yeah, yeah. So like individually. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can show you an example of a, of a, of a good answer, like with me. Uh, I probably don't want right now, but I mean, I the reason was just don't want to flash the answer of a person. Say again? I'm just talking to myself, sorry. No, no, no. To talk to us, we we need you to. Okay. Uh, was the actual, like, instruction part of the line. And then the red one was like the index with the X. Where's my door? Why is it on a different? Ah, because it's like 
it's in a separate it's in a separate screen okay so yeah. i will so pa, 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 let me show you a good answer maybe something like this oh mm. that's how this answer was provided so essentially that's that's a, an example for which we didn't subtract any any points right and I can I can copy paste it uh, online to make sure that we have a sample answer if you want. Sometimes it's helpful. Sorry, what was your question? So nothing or something important? No. Okay, let's move to the next one. So calling conventions. So write the call side assembly code for the following function. Assume that the variable a is in the register ebx, and you want to place the return value back into a, so back into ebx. So on this is the call side, right? So it's not go compile, uh, cheating a little, but still, uh, but no, go ahead, compile. Uh, I take it as, an, as a, as a, as a decent approach to answering this question. Maybe it will be faster for you to at least sketch the answer yourself. But if you like, if you're very efficient with this code explorer, right? So online tool, which, uh, you can try using it. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, how do we do it? Let me just quickly illustrate the technique. Uh, uh, God, code. Uh, Compiler Explorer, okay, this one. Um, that's what you would probably do during the exam. So it's allowed, you say, look, uh, I have a function uh, foo, it takes, I forgot how many integers, let's say three, right? into b and into c i don't know what it does maybe it returns return zero for example and uh, and then i say look i wanna i wanna just uh, say a or whatever int x equals to foo of one to whatever was there right uh and here you start fighting a little bit, right? So you say, look, I, where is my call side? My call side is here. Uh, and yeah, sure, if it's helpful to you, it actually did generate your call side, right? Hmm. Agree with this? So yes. that's one way to do it. So I don't mind it. So if you, I, in, in a way, I support use of any tools, right? Because uh, often if you can understand what the tool is doing, it's almost that you can do it yourself, right? Many cases. So I, I think, yeah, go for it. It's totally, totally legit. Uh, there was a couple, you were first, I think. You can, yeah. And uh, I will I will be here and I will tell like uh, TAs that it's fine, but we're gonna be watching you. What is that you're using? And we'll be yelling at you. So we should be using the... You can use any tool, okay. any tool which compiles. So I noticed that the... Assembly this is generating is for uh, sixty four bit, not thirty two bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you looking for a specific uh, kind of assembly? Yeah. So yeah, since the answer is thirty two, really, compilation <laughs> failed. Uh, but I thought that M. No, is that not ah uh, minus M thirty two like this? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're better than me. Look with these tools. Congrats. Achievement unlocked. Uh, but this is why like, I'm teaching. Like, I'm, like, I, you will be laughing. My students are better than many different ways, right? So, okay, cool. So wait, so thank you. Yes, 64 bit. Any other comments or questions about, but let's get back to this, to the answer. We just spend a second here and then go back to PDF. Any, any, any questions about the compiler explorer? So that's fine to you, right? So, but if you go back to PDF still, let's just make sure that we know how to write the answer correctly. Because again, if you just simply copy code from Compiler Explorer, I might disagree with you, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, so how do we generate the code side, call side? Yeah, we know that there should be a call instruction, foo, right? Mm -hmm. Then what? So. We're pushing the arguments on the stack. We remember the calling conventions, right? So we push uh, what here? 
I think A, right? And A is in which register? In the EBX, right? So we push EBX. Agree? Then we push what? One, and then we push two. Exactly. And so what do we do here? In the It tells you, and you want to place the return value back into A. So back into EBX, right? Yeah, move into EBX. I'm using Intel assembly from EIX, right? It's reasonably easy. And I would assume, I mean, I would assume that you come prepared to, to understand calling conventions, right? So maybe it's even faster to write it down yourself. But if you're not sure, then you can run the Power Explorer. But again, any approach is fine. So I just noticed a, a brief thing when I was kind of reviewing it myself, but uh, is there something, we would also need to update our stack pointer to go back to before we push those parameters. Smart. Actually, yes. I forgot about it. Good job. Well, that's very, very smart. I, I like in class right now, I, when I was reviewing it myself, like today before the lecture, I remember that, yes, we have to adjust the stack pointer. And by the way, this is this adjustment. Yeah. So maybe a compiler explorer will help you to remember that. So they said, look, because you pushed uh, in this specific example, you pushed three integers on the stack, you adjust by 12. In our example, we have to adjust by what? Do you, remember, do you understand? So I would, I would argue that we should probably put it uh, before the move, but I guess it's equivalent, so it doesn't matter. So we're going to sub or... What do we have to do? Do we have to sub or do we have to add? Add, exactly, right. So we have to add. Say again. Mm, you can do pops, but then it wastes too much instructions, right? So it's like three. And here we just say in kind of like, we'd forget about it. So we do ESP and what is the value? 12? No, 12. Ah, 12. Yeah, because we pushed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, thank you. Good. Good catch. So, any other comments? The other thing I thought about was, isn't it responsible, responsibility of all the to save EAX and EX registers before calling to <laughs> and restore them? You will get probably extra points. Right, you're right. So, and I, I didn't want to go into those details, but you're right. So. If I were to say here, and by the way, make sure that you save and restore caller registers, then yes, you have to save and restore caller safe registers, right? But uh, again, uh, uh, I, that, that's nice to know. So let's see what this code explorer does. So uh, they, they don't do anything because they say, well, the instruction is so short that we don't really need to save anything. We're not going to use those registers anyway, right? So that's why I didn't want to get into those details. But you're right. So that's a good point that you remember this. Any other ideas? Good. Again, so still relatively easy. So not, not super hard. It gives you only five points, though. Um, so let's go to the next one. So relocation, 20 points. So again, it's similar to what you just had uh, in the homework, right? So essentially, I give you... Uh, I give you a printout of a function. So more specifically, it's a function from XV6 uh, word count. It's actual implementation of word count in XV6, right? Uh, and I asking you which lines will reside will result in assembly code that would require relocation if loaded at a different memory address. Explain your answer. Assume the fun all the functions that WC uses are external meaning that this read, write, whatever, read and stuff are external uh, from a different object file. And XV6 is because maybe last year we, uh, we, we, we were talking more about position independent code. So maybe that's why I'm emphasizing this. Okay, so let's start. So let's start which, find the first line which requires relocation in this. Uh... <laughs> Okay, good question. Right, so it defines a variable. So it essentially says, okay, please allocate space in a data section for this uh, buffer of 512 bytes. 
So it's literally just the data section. So we only really give references like the uses of the of this variable, right? But not the declaration, right? Or definition, right? Mm -hmm. Is it clear to everyone? It's kind of important. I think people were missing this point. So well, basically, I'm uh, thinking uh, thinking all the reference lines. Okay, let's take it a little slower. So again, so this is just, just defines a function. So there will be like a label, right? But we don't use with WC. If we were to use WC recursively, at some point when we would call WC, uh, it would be still a relative relative call, right? So it wouldn't require relocation, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, here, for example, those guys are passed on a stack. So they something EBP or ESP plus one plus something. Those guys are allocated on a stack or registers. All right. And so when we use them here, it's again, it doesn't require relocation because none of these are global, right? Similar to this one. So it's a local variable. And so line 15 is the first line which uses this function, right? And it will be something like call read, right? And read is a global address, right? So you have to patch this, like this instruction, call read, right? What else do you have to patch in this in this line? Buff, right? So you and you actually have to, depending on how the code is generated, you might have to patch it twice, right? Because well, typically size of size of is a macro, so it will get expanded. Uh, so the compiler will actually put an actual, yeah, five twelve. So just just one one instance of this buff, right? Okay, good. Uh, and FD is still here, so it's not there. Okay, so sixteen doesn't require anything, right? C plus plus is again local variable. Here in 18, we're again using buff, right? So this will require relocation. Here in 20, we say string char or something, right? Uh, str, pa, pa, pa. You're comparing, you're, I guess, comparing is against this set. So in this line, so this is relocation. So the call of a function, but what else will require relocation here? Oh. And buff and what else the string itself right so this string is actually in a global in the data section right and you will have to relocate the when you access the address of it right so and yeah so you really have to say that in this one is this three things will need relocation again this is a local variable local 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 let's scroll down here is our printf requires relocation don't forget that the string itself also requires relocation because it's a different oh. string yeah you said that in the line 20 we need uh we need to reallocate the uh, right, uh, first uh, like uh, the in the data set how about in the line 18 do we need to reallocate the the slash n no slash n is actually okay this is a good question so yeah. actually excellent question so what's the difference between this green string and a and a and a n? It's one byte. And uh it it gets a little bit weird, right? That yeah. some yeah. constants, like string constants, the, the C compiler allocates in a data section. Mm -hmm. And so simple constants like characters and like for example, this zero, right? And one, right? We never ask about zeros yeah. and ones. Yeah. They actually allocate them in place, meaning that the instruction itself, so for example, the CMP instruction, which will be comparing something, let's say buff is loaded in the EAX, it will be comparing with zero. So really the storage for this zero, which is like, okay, whatever, N is not, N is zero, no, N is not zero. It's some other symbol, let's say 55 again, yeah. right? The storage is actually in the instruction itself, right? So there's, there will be an opcode, which says it's CMP, <laughs> there will be, and typically, and it's an opcode plus whatever register you're using, right? And this, there will be like some number of bytes here, like maybe four if it's uh, the full integer, or maybe it's a one byte. We only will require maybe one extra byte for keeping this fifty-five, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like it's in place, so it's a little, it's it's tricky. But again, it's nice that you guys kind of ask these questions and you can get the answer by saying, okay, I got it. That's actually there. 
right, because the C compiler puts them in a data section. Uh, yeah, yeah, this one is so, so I didn't get to it. So exit will require relocation, print half, this string, and uh, I think nothing here, right? Uh, like this line 32, if it would be in, inside the, the string is, well, the string is not changing actually, because, right, but imagine if it's even in the loop. It will not be changing. So the way printf works is that it takes this uh, format string and it stays the constant and just say, First of all, I printf uses this uh, tricky business in C, which allows you to pass a variable number of arguments. Mm -hmm. So one argument, uh, like there is a like specific ABI for that, so the, how they encode it, but there will be a thing on the stack which says, okay, I'm passing five arguments, and next time I will be passing six. And you have to parse this thing and, and so on. And this string will stay constant every time. The printf itself internally, and it's 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 a good thing. So because maybe no one ever wondered how printf is actually implemented, but printf will literally scan through this format string, figure out that okay, this is this the format specified digit, and then it will print out L converting it to a digit. There will be like a tiny loop and it will actually output characters like zero, one, two, three, four, five on the string because it represents zero, one, two, three, four, five number, right? So that was printed with the Right, exactly. Right, as a as a format, but but again, you can come up with the with an example of a pathological function which actually modifies the string, but it again it modifies it in a data section, and it's really not your business as long as you know the the address of this string in a data section. The fact that it gets changed, well, it means something, and hopefully, it means something meaningful, but. Um, but uh, it's fine. It doesn't matter. It can be like a string. Yeah. So, and if if it's really really confusing, then uh, like uh, I you said, okay, like compilers generate, uh, and there is certain freedom in how you can generate code, right? So you uh, like you remember we've seen something like character hello some array here and we say something like hello and this one was actually allocated on the stack we've saw it once so and if it's that obscure you can argue for your points back because remember and i i literally don't really know the c standard whether it dictates anything about how to allocate this hello but we've seen where like it, it was really like pushed into this array on the stack and not in a global section. And it would be nice to guess. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask for the line 18 and 19, but then 20 for the bar of I, is it possible for the compiler to optimize? Correct. What you're saying is, let me just uh, clear, uh, I cannot really clear everything. I will just erase here a little, <laughs> or let me just rather change the color. What you're saying is that, uh, is it possible for a compiler to load this buff once in a register, for example, yeah. EAX, and then just use it? And mm -hmm. so, which means that, well, maybe the second line will not require relocation because the variable is already in the EAX. Yes, mm -hmm. it's totally possible inside the loop, and compilers will definitely do this. Mm -hmm. So I will take both answers if you just justify that. You know, it can go one way or another. But I would still argue. I would still say that please, like. Make sure that this one, like, include it in your answer. Just don't assume blindly that it's optimized. Questions? All good? Anyone? Okay, this is clear. Okay, let's move to the next one. Stacks. Oh, man, this is my hardest question. This is the really the one which, uh, like, works towards the histogram because the previous ones were like, ah, whatever, we all can do it, right? So this one is a little challenging. So let's read it aloud carefully. 
So I say typically the stack is implemented as a continuous region of memory, right? That pre that is pre-allocated by the operating system when the process or a thread starts executing. This, however, has certain limitations. So for example, or in other words, some programs need tiny stacks and some large. So there is no size that fits all. As a system designer, you decide to support stacks of variable lengths. Specifically, I mean, meaning that you wanna build a, a runtime, which somehow can change the stack size or allow the stacks to grow, right? And this is what I say here. Uh, specifically on entry to each function, you want to check the size of the current stack. And if it's less than a certain constant, which you can define, allocate more memory for the stack. Of course, the stack is no longer a single continuous region of memory, but a collection of regions that are somehow linked together. And it's your choice how to link them. How do you need to change the prologue and epilogue of the function? In other words, what assembly code the compiler sh should generate on entry and return from a function for this idea to work? Okay, let's think for a second. That's arguably maybe the, the hardest question of this midterm. <laughs> you probably have to work with the compiler to do this. So like have the compiler sometimes tell you uh, this is how much space I need, and then you just allocate the space for that stack just at the beginning and then you the allocate the end. So what you're pretty much doing is like at the very beginning, I know that I will need this much space, no more, no less. So you like change the stack in such a way so that it does that and then at the end you undo that. That's roughly correct, but let's I, I ask you to be more uh, more specific. So if we if we were to look at this uh, at this code of this string length function, okay let me just delete it. Oh it doesn't delete. Uh, I wanted to I wanted to specifically usually it used to delete. Uh, specifically, look at this prologue. Man, really? Uh, just missing, missing the delete button. So look, look at this two instructions, which uh, kind of set the like the frame point. Or imagine like if you have the stack, and uh, it was let's say one page, four ninety six bytes, right? And it was growing, 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 growing. And when you call this function, the stack is already somewhere here. And it's your job to understand that there is not enough space. So you say, maybe I want 128 bytes, or maybe 64 bytes, or maybe 32 bytes. You choose the constant. And if you say, look, I'm, I'm so close to the like, edge of that page, right? that I think I will ask the operating system for another page. I will allocate another page somewhere. And uh, I, will, I will invoke this function by somehow setting up this, the, the frame, the stack frame for this function string length on the new page because I have a, like a whole page of space, right? And somehow I have to remember that this this was my previous page, right? So now these these are your stacks. Probably want to keep around a pointer to that, and then you check by so like tracking the stack pointer from that. Checking that the stack pointer is actually still left. Yeah. So what you're saying, let's uh, dedicate one register, ESI, for example, to hold the end of the stack. Uh, or alternatively, you can also make an assumption, which is a little bit simpler than just keeping a register, that your stacks are of a specific size, let's say a page, and also are page aligned. Because then you can just use the ESP align it to the beginning of the page or to the end of the page, right? And then compute how much space is left. It's a little easier, but both techniques will work. So, and yeah, so in this question, I don't ask you to like, I mean, feel free to give me assembly examples for how you build it, but plain English will work and I can maybe clarify, but that's good line. You say, look, okay, I'm first I, I will make sure that somewhere here, I will do some kind of a 
size check and you describe how you do the side check by like either keeping an extra register or relying on the fact that the stacks are aligned and there is only so much space left unless you say I have at least one, maybe 16 bytes of space, right? So, okay, good. So we imagine we did the size check and uh, we are short of uh, short of space. So what do we do next? Uh, footer, okay, and you had some idea too. Right, so M map uh, or in XV6, it's SBRK to get a new page. And if you really want to play with alignment and those functions might not return aligned, then you have to like maybe allocate double the size and then align. But the point here is that you said the footer, I kind of argued that we don't need the footer because really you never really need a pointer. Let me just figure out where my pointer is okay, here. You never really need a pointer from here to here. You only need a pointer from the new stack to the old one because you only have to say, when I'm exiting the function, I have to deallocate this frame and use the previous one, right? So we don't really need a footer. Got it? So people are following this? Okay. Uh, okay, cool. So we allocate it with a map or SBRK. We have a new page. Yeah, so we probably want to guess, we want to push a pointer to the previous, I don't know how to call it, like let's call it a stack page or something, uh, to a previous stack page somewhere here, right? So we can come back to it. Uh, there is a little bit of a, but like, and this is already kind of a, a decent solution. And you say, look, when we're going to be exiting, we will do a similar check whether we are close to like beginning of this current page somewhere here, right? And if it's so, we detect that we have to deallocate this page, right? Is it right? Because when we're exiting the function, we have to we have to free this page, right? So, but what I wanted to emphasize here is that what happens to the arguments, right? So because it's a little it's a little tricky here. So let me just. Uh, uh, orange. So remember, someone who called us, our caller, already pushed our arguments here, right? The code which is generated by the compiler uses the arguments something like this, EBP plus something, right? So we're really an EBP because we also might be allocating space for local variables, probably should point to our current stack page which probably means that we have to copy those arguments from here mm -hmm. to here to make sure that they are kind of in continuous memory, right? Mm -hmm. And it's okay, maybe it's like at this point is an extra tricky, but uh, but you, you copy them here and supposedly the compiler knows the signature of a function, so it knows how many arguments are passed, so you can just move them and then deallocate them later. And maybe moving, uh, no, you don't probably have to move them back. You just have to deal with it. Correct. So this specifically what you're saying that, uh, let me just uh, change a different how type. Uh, let's say blue. So you don't, this this part of this backwards pointer can be just implemented with this push EBP instruction, right? So yeah, I agree with that. So that can change. They can leave almost unchanged. Could it also be a valid answer to do something that we have some set of space to and if you ever cross a boundary, um, it just ran with the stack uh, hold on, you lost me. So what is the idea of how, how, how is the page table involved? So translate the stack, the stack addresses to point to those different tables. Let me let me quickly, so you can do the following, uh, which is reasonable. And maybe it's not what you're suggesting, but I just wanted to explore this. So 
again, you can say, look, I, I'm still like, let's assume I'm on a 64-bit operating system. Why 64-bit? Because my virtual addresses are, my virtual address space is just giant. I don't know. It's in terms of uh, maybe even petabytes or something, right? Or terabytes for sure. And you say, look, I instead of doing this trickery with those stacks, what I'm going to do, I will still allocate a super huge stack. Like I reserve virtual space for a super huge stack, let's say four gigabytes or maybe 16, right? And you say, I'm going to, I will only map one page through a page table and I will draw a page table here. And this page will be like essentially mapped by a physical page, right? And uh, it will be used. And the moment you go into the next page, you will get a page fold, which we didn't yet study. It goes into the operating system, operating system like reasons that this virtual uh, range of addresses uh, will be allocated and you will figure out uh, like some other physical page and you add it to the page table to make sure that this page is now mapped to another physical page. That's an approach, right? Uh, I probably phrased my answer or question in such a way that I kind of say, I don't want to hear about this approach, but I appreciate you mentioning it. Let's quickly discuss what are the disadvantages and advantages of this approach. What are the advantages? Mm -hmm. Easy, right? So you don't have yeah. to mess with the compiler. You can just take uh, existing binary yeah. and just, because it's completely transparent to the application, right? Yeah. Good. What are the disadvantages? Well, we waste a lot of trees over the space. No, but the space is virtual. On a 32-bit machine, mm -hmm. this trick will be harder to play because you know your, your whole virtual address yeah, space is, is yeah. Right, but imagine you have it. So, but still, what will be a disadvantage? It's multiple what? Hopes. It's a harder, it's a longer process to reach the memory. Let me, let me, let me give you a hint. Page folds are kind of expensive. So we haven't yet covered how they are really implemented. We will. But uh, when you're trying to access this page and the operating system is kicked in with this line of a page fold, it takes you cycles. It takes you a fair amount of cycles, right? So let's say maybe 10,000 cycles, uh, which is not ideal in some scenarios. Another question is how you will at what point you will garbage collect this page? Imagine you at some point use the ton of stack and then immediately deallocated it. At this point, you have to somehow make a, like support the deallocation or garbage collection of those pages. Mm -hmm. It's possible you can monitor the pages. Remember the page table has this access bit and you might identify, you have logic inside the operating system saying, okay, those are pages on the stack and they were not accessed recently. So let's garbage collect them back, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, it all takes some amount of cycles, right? So this might not be ideal. So transparency of the solution is an advantage here. The fact that it takes cycles and needs garbage collect the pages is another disadvantage. And the final disadvantage that you still set the hard limit. So who knows? Tomorrow someone comes with a with a genomic application, and this limit might not be sufficient, right? Mm -hmm. So again, I would say in practice, both approaches are taken. So for example, Rust uh, up until a certain point was using this uh, trick of uh, checking the space on the stack and allocating additional chunk, like I was kind of asking in that solution. It was used in Rust. They give it up because they had some regression tests in which uh, like if you're really on the edge of these two pages and you allocate, deallocate, allocate, deallocate, mm -hmm. some but performance benchmarks were really performing poorly. It just like, sorry, it's just a coincidence that it happens, right? So this, and they said, okay, forget about it. We will use continuous, larger continuous stacks are kind of like this, right? Uh, but there's a limit, hard limit in Rust, for example. So I'm just saying that this this question is real uh, question. Um, like, 
this is another approach. If, if we um, kind of establish a policy of having a separate factory for the trolley company and then store the base on the of the previous factory, the college factory, and the machine, then some simple indication might allow us to access the argument from the previous factory because it's still an engine. Right. So what you what you're saying is that we instead of moving the arguments before calling the function, we do the check, right? You know, so 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 the arguments are in the caller caller stack space. Yeah. And now we're in the body stack. Space, yeah. But in the body instance, Ah, so change the compiler to refer to the previous CPP. Yeah. yeah, that's possible. But then it like changes the code. You can you can do this in coding, right? So you have to think of how you encode it in a general way to support both cases where you are staying on the same stack page or, or between two pages, right? But it's possible maybe with another level of interaction, but yeah, doable, yeah. So how, okay. how much Well, asking for a new register is probably naive, right? So again, if you're interviewing at Google, they want us here like a pra pragmatic solution. Yeah. So better stick with like, if the question is not this one, but some hypothetical question, and it's so like, it produces such a huge performance bottleneck, you can explain ideally how you can do it on existing architecture and then suggest new hardware support, which is an extra bonus for you, right? And examples would be obviously like I mean like I don't know, matrix multiplication or something or some crypto primitives where you say look I computing this as a, whatever like what is it symmetric keys in one of those symmetric ciphers so frequently that I really need an instruction or like a good example is this hashing function which is there in the CPU is CR I think it's called CRC right Intel supports CRC so it's a very it's a fast and reasonably good uh, hashing function which they implemented in hardware so it takes like three cycles versus like if you use something like city hash then it takes maybe 20 cycles depending on the length of the key right but for, for small keys okay good so this is this we understood so this is probably the trickiest uh, that i wanted to at least spend okay this is an open-ended stack okay back to address translation 10 points by the way, you can always judge the complexity of the question by points, right? So this is re relatively simple, right? So it's again, similar to what we did in the homework, what it says, uh, CR3 holds uh, address zero, physical page number zero. The page table directory page is at the physical address zero, obviously, because CRC points there. The flags are PTEP present, PTEU user accessible, PTEW writable. And so, this is what the page table looks like. Page directory entry, like the, the zero entry is page, physical page number one, second one, one, two, all of them are present, so no tricks here. And the page table page uh, at physical address one, right, which is this one, which is pointed here and here, right, is contains those entries and another page, and a page table at address two contains those entries, right? Did you follow? So this, like I can draw it again. So here for you, just to make sure that we are on the same page. So if this is address zero, this is address one in physical memory. This is page number two, right? CR3, CR3 points to zero, this has several entries, I think three, right? So this has three entries, the first two point to one and the last one. So this two points to this one, this one points to this one, and this one points to this one, right? You got it? And then those entries will point somewhere else, right? Right, got it? How to follow this? Okay, now the question. Using the same format, oh, wait, hold on. So what's the question? What physical address, the does the virtual, or if you like it to be more specific, linear address OX100 translates to? Explain your answer. Uh, let's zoom out a little so it fits on the screen. The screen is tiny, but we have all of it. Okay, so how do we go about it? Just looking for the 
correct. Yeah, so we have, uh, we take this one, we want to split it into 10 bits, uh, 10 bits and uh, 12 bits, right? And uh, like you can, again, let me show you a trick if you have hard time splitting. Uh, let me do this. So we do something like Python. Uh, like let's zoom in a little. And you say OX1000, uh, zero, 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 but you say this is, let me just move it. Uh, this is uh, DAC, but if you say, look, I want to see it as a binary, you say bin, uh, and you you get it, right? And you, like, at this point, you can either count the bits or you can do the shifts, so something like uh, uh, you can shift it by, uh, by 12, right? And you get one. Or if you shift it by 22, you get zero, right? Mm -hmm. So just, just make sure that you are comfortable using those tools. Or if you like, if you really like say, okay, I don't, I don't trust my Python skills. Uh, although yours are probably be better than mine at this point. Uh, I'm sorry, where's my, so you can say, you can split this in four. You say, this is uh, like, this is exactly 12. And so the, the bit, bit above 12 is one. So roughly speaking, what I meant to say is that we have, uh, where's my pointer? This is zero, this is one, and this is zero again, right? So we did the split, right? Agree with this? So which means that now we know how to do the translation. So who can help me with that? Yeah, in the, in the root of a page table, we take the entry zero. From there, we pick this one. So which means that we land on this one, right? And from here, we take one. So it gets us the virtual address. Oh, I took zero, sorry. Yeah. Look, you're better than me already, which is good. I, yeah, don't do goofy mistakes. You take entry one. And so the virtual address becomes OX6000, right? Uh, because this one is also zero. If I would have a, some 55. It will be, let's say, not 55, 1F. Uh, then it would be 1601F, right? Agree with this? So, this, I guess I, I was, I confused because I thought that the offset was added to it. So, what I would have said is that the address was the same. Yeah. And, same. and then you add, you add the offset at the end of what you. Hold on. This. And the offset is zero, so it, it should be six. Oh, that's okay. It's a physical page number, yeah. which means that the offset would be the lowest 12 bits. This is the offset within the page. That's why I said if it's 1F, it would be 1F here, right? But physical page number, if you if it's six in hex, you just add three zeros here because three zeros represent 12 bits, right? Okay. Wait, hold on, let me, is it clear? No. So, but we have the 12 bit offset, we didn't add the 12 bit offset. Right. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. It's, it's kind of important to understand it. So, we have like two more minutes. So, remember when we split everything into this uh, 10, 10, and 12, right? The lowest 12 bits define whatever the, the virtual or physical page is. Those 12 bits define either the byte zero in within this page or the very last byte which is uh which is uh 495 right so if if all of these are ones here then it will be this last bit right byte sorry right agree so but they they cannot escape the the page right because it's exactly like like designed this way and those are just indices right and so the first index index lands you on the page table directory you pick an entry and this number inside the page table is the physical page number so it's it's not really the address it's a number so you have to multiply it by 496 right mm -hmm. or alternatively this conversion is if this number is one in multiplication by 496 in hex just simply adds three zeros here right mm -hmm. so you're kind of shifting by 12 to the to the left right so it's the same Right, and similar to this entry, when it says six, it's a physical page number six. So it's 
in this address space, it will be a page which is like, this one is three, this one is four, this one is five. And you thought that I'm stuck, but I'm not stuck because I can move it around. Success, right? And uh, and this will be page six, right? So it's it says physical page number equals to six, and then the offset within the page are those the lowest twelve bytes, right? So I think the flags and the physical page number were kind of included in one like hexadecimal value. Okay, so hold on, let me, I here I used commas, but I can very much uh, use ors, right? Right, yeah. Because uh, it actually, uh, well, no, like, yeah, so you have to do PPN uh, shifted by 12. Right, and I forgot. How, yeah, maybe I made a mistake and wrote differently on grade scope, and let me let me fix it. But just to make sure, and this is how we saw it in the code, right? So right. we we always like represented the uh, like shifted. Physical address should be physical address, not the physical address, not the physical address. Just be handled because zero and six things are be physical, not. Uh. Which one? That one. Here, here, here. Oh, this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should be physical, not virtual. virtual. Oh, yeah, yeah, physical. Sorry, yeah. Okay, hold on. So I left one question unanswered. Uh, I will probably just post an answer online. So it's reasonably straightforward because it only asked for 10 points. So I'm pretty sure you can figure it out. Okay, so then uh, good luck. I will see you Thursday. Uh, if anything, ask me on the... Yaza or my office hours are today as well. Right.